If I could have your attention, please. I'd like to welcome everybody to our class tonight. And I'd like to introduce you to Elaine Hendrickson. And she's a retired middle school educator who was the 2001 Maine Teacher of the Year. Wow. She has turned her attention to outdoor education sharing her love of our natural environment with students of all ages. We're a testament to that. <laughs> she and her husband Eric have spent many hours supporting and exploring Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument on foot, <coughs> by bike, and in canoe. Together they have led hikes to, into the monument for the Friends of Katahdin Woods and the Waters National Monument, and the main International Appalachian Trail members, and other groups of interested visitors as well. Elaine has been a member of the Katahdin Learning Project since 2016, helping conduct programs for teachers and students in the monument. Currently, Elaine is a member of the Francis Malcolm Science Center Board of Directors in Easton, where she is providing outdoor education for, to local students. Elaine and her husband live in Presque Isle, as well as exploring the Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. They enjoy cross-country and alpine skiing, traveling, and camping in their adventure van, visiting other national parks and monuments, and they enjoy they are enjoying their infant grandson, Anders, who lives lives in Idaho. So, Elaine, <coughs> take it away. Thank you. Well, it's so nice to be here with you today. As a matter of fact, we were in Katahdin Woods and Waters this morning and um, doing a little bit of exploring or, or snooping, I guess I should say, today. <coughs> so. Eric and I have been, and I want to introduce, by the way, my husband Eric. He's sitting back. He's my chauffeur, but he's also the guy that got me outdoors. I did not grow up in an outdoor family. My father's entertainment was cleaning his car and mowing his lawn. So I didn't get out much and do anything outdoors except maybe playing outdoors, but no hiking. I did some biking, nothing like that until we got married where uh, we celebrated our 49th wedding anniversary last week. And so I have been, he has brought me up really in loving the outdoors and doing things in the outdoors. So that's where I've learned a lot from him and that's where my passion has come from. So he's gonna pop in a couple times tonight and share some things with you that he's much more knowledgeable about than I am about Katahdin Woods and Waters. So we actually began the journey in Katahdin Woods and Waters back before it became a monument. We had some friends, Susan and Mark Adams, who actually worked for Elliottsville Plantation, of which Roxanne Quimby was the owner of that. And so Mark and Susan were the caretakers of this area that Roxanne Quimby was amassing, which ended up being 87,500 acres east of the uh, Baxter State Park. And so we were out and we enjoyed and snooped and did a lot of exploring before it became a monument, and we have done a lot of exploring since it has become a monument. As a matter of fact, yesterday, was it yesterday? Monday, yes, it was yesterday, we met with the archeologist who was doing some more research in the area to find some ancient Native American sites. And so we had a good time working with them, and some of the places that he was exploring were sites that we had initially explored, and Eric had actually written up a little bit of information about. So it's, it's been a journey, and so we really love it there, and I hope that um, after this pres presentation you'll want to visit. Have any of you been there before? Awesome. So hopefully I can share some places that you may not have seen there. So you have a brochure and you have a map, so I'll be referencing some of those places on the map. So in 
2016, on August 24th, President Barack Obama declared Katahdin Woods and Waters a national monument. For those of you that don't know the distinction, I've had some people come up and ask me, so is there a monument there? So they really think there's a physical stone structure or a monument at, in the park. No. It's just in the designation of how it became a park. It's part of the national park system. A monument is declared by the president. So the president of the United States, through the Antiquities Act that uh, Theodore Roosevelt wrote, can declare a monument. In order for Katahdin Woods and Waters to become a park, it has to be supported by our United States Senators. Unfortunately, at this point, we have not had a lot of support from our Senators. Uh, they are doing more now, but when it first was founded in, on April, uh, in August 24th, they did not support it. So now, you may have heard in the news for the past couple of weeks, they have proposed that Katahdin Woods and Waters be able to purchase land adjacent to the monument so that they can <coughs> expand right of ways and also perhaps um, build a visitor center on land that's not in the monument itself. So this past year, the monument celebrated its seventh, or excuse me, sixth anniversary. This picture was taken on the weekend that it became a monument. And we dim had the lights just a tad in the front. Yeah. Can Did I wonder? dim the lights a little bit? Oh, that's one of their, the their jobs. Dim the lights. I think I can see, as long as I can see some of my notes, that's fine. Okay. Yeah, you look just a program. <laughs> it, it is right. So, um, we had the opportunity, we were invited because we had done a lot of exploring and wandering in the area uh, to the cell of the first celebration that was held to honor this new national park. This is my father-in-law, who is now 102 years old. He's still living, wow. and he's doing great. And this is Sally Jewell. She was the Secretary of the Interior at that point in time, and she came up to celebrate with us. And then there's me, and then there's my husband, Eric. So it was a very exciting time when that happened. Eric will tell you a story about, he went to Washington, D.C. to help <coughs> promote for the park, or talk about the park, and met Sally Jewell. And she kept hinting at him that we should, we always go out west to visit our daughter in August, that we shouldn't go yet. And then we found out it was going to be a national monument at that time. <laughs> So you have this map in front of you. Yours may be a little bit different color. Some of you have a newer edition. The Tide Woods and Waters National Monument is made up of three different parcels of land. And um, we're going to be talking mostly about this area and the northern area. So this is the, what we call the southern area of the monument. And those of you that have been down, maybe you have visited the Loop Road and ridden the Loop Road. And so the Loop Road is this road that goes around here. And people have come, and they have crossed the Wasatiquip River, and they have said, oh, we're there. But unfortunately, it's another drive to get into where the monument actually starts. So this is one parcel of land. The next piece that we typically hear about is the northern end, where you come in for Patton. This area you get to by coming in from Sherman. The northern end you get to by coming in through Patton. It's actually uh, not too far from the road that goes to the north end of Baxter. And so that area is has some nice hikes. That's where we were working with the archaeologists this weekend, and that's where in the winter they pack for cross-country skiing and snowshoeing. So that area you can use in the, in the winter. And then we have another parcel of land up here, which is called the Savoy's parcel because the Savoy's River runs right next to it and through part of it. And the Park Service has worked a lot on that part right now, improving the road 
and they're beginning to develop that area. We're in hopes that maybe they'll be in the long distant future, a dark sky place there so that you can observe the dark skies. And I'll talk more a little bit about that later. And Eric, I'm not really sure. This is just kind of a loose parcel sticking around. It's called the Hunt Parcel. Oh, that's the Hunt Parcel? OK. There is an old, there was an old farm here called the Hunt Farm that's very, has a historic background. And they um, used to raise cattle and supply the lumbermen when they were coming in to cut lumber. And they're hoping to get, aren't they hoping to get this park connected down there so that it will all be one park and it will be connected. There, some people say that there's no hunting, there's no snowmobiling, there's no ATVing allowed in the monument, so that's why they were against it. And on the, um, you have on the east side of the Penob East Branch and Penobscot River, because the Penobscot River flows down on the edge of it. On the east side, there is hunting allowed. There is, well, there's fishing allowed throughout. And then they can ATV and they can snowmobile through there. Uh, unfortunately, some of the landowners around the property don't allow ATVing or snowmobiling, so it's kind of hard to access. But there is hunting and fishing and um, uh, snowmobiling and ATVing allowed in the in National Monument. So there are three uh, rivers that flow through it that are important. That's what made it the waters part of Katahdin Woods and Waters. So we have the east branch of the Penobscot, which is the very edge over here. We have the Satacook Stream, and then we have the Savoy's River that I just mentioned. And there is paddling on each one of those that people can kayak or canoe down each one of those. Last year was the fifth anniversary. It was a big celebration. This year, we did not go to the celebration. We did go to the celebration last year. And they, it showed a lot of growth because I'm going to give you a few statistics. And this was last year, maybe more now. So when the monument was first established, there was one employee. We had a superintendent come who was the, whose name was Tim Hudson. And he had been superintendent, started his career out west in Yellowstone, and then had done many things. He did retire this past year. He had over 50 years in the Park Service, and he did retire. So the visitation increased from 15,000 to 41,000, who brought in um, $3.3 million to the area. And of course, that was one of the things that parks do. National parks have a name. People want to come visit. And so hopefully we're going to see more hotels and restaurants. Well, it has a good side and a bad side. But bringing in money for that particular area. And so to help the Katahdin region, because it's a poor area, because the mill's closed. And this has brought new jobs into the area. So what I'd like to share with you are some things that we enjoy about the monument. And this is a group of kids welcoming you to Katahdin Woods and Waters. And this is the welcome sign that we have now. Someday we'll get the official welcome sign, but that's what we have right now to welcome people into the monument. And that's the first, at the first mile of our zero mile of the Loop Road. So, one of the reasons that it was chosen to be a monument is because it has natural and cultural resources. And I mentioned yesterday we were in the monument and we were working with the archaeologist. And this is several years ago we had a chance to work with the archaeologist to determine where some of these Native American, early Native American sites were. So yesterday, what we were doing, we were kind of eliminating where they might have been, although they did find some arrowhead chips uh, near the river at this particular place, which was the um, Haskell, Haskell, uh, Haskell Campground. So that has been going on for a number of years. The Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters and the Park Service are very aware of 
how sacred this area is to our Native Americans in the Wabanaki culture. So they have been very careful to develop it gradually and not ruin some of their sacred places. Now, there is a lot of logging history that's there. And my husband, Eric, has been very involved in researching the lumbering camps that are there. And I'm going to let him talk a little bit about what we have done to try to find the lumber camps. And I have some pictures of some. And as a result of his research, he has written a book. I'll promote him, even though he doesn't promote himself. So he has written a book, Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument, where he has gathered all of this research about the different lumbering camps that were there and how they ran. Eric, if you talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah, uh, lumbering was important there. Uh, one of the reasons it's important is because the Wasatico River was probably the last place in the United States, east of the Mississippi, where logging was done. The reason it was so difficult, they started in 1842, they cut the forest, and they didn't get those logs that they cut out until 1882. So it sat there for a long time. And what they did in 1882, they built 24 dams and logging camps and amounted to clean the valley. And Draper, the last person there, when he was done, he said that there wasn't one stick of wood left in the valley that had any value. And if you look at the old pictures, the whole valley is just barren. Now it's back to forest again. So there's a lot of history there. We've systematically, uh, to go back a step before it became a monument, I was involved in the resource inventory of it. And when the, the resource inventory was done, there were two pages of places that they couldn't find. So over the years, we've systematically hunted those places down. We found the wells, we found villages, we found skis and old dams and so forth. And uh, so that makes, I'm listed as an independent resource researcher now for the National Park Service. And some of the things that they're very interested in, if you look in the upper right hand corner there, there's a log. The archeologist is really excited about things like that, far more than I am, <laughs> but they want to core it and then they can get the age of the tree that was there. So they know exactly how old the forest was at the time. And from that, they can look at back past where the big forest fires were there, which is what made the monument so important in the first place, and see what had happened in the past 300 years or so. So logging is important. Uh, it's one of the three really big things that they have in the monument that are, that are important in history. So this one is called Robar Dam. And just to give you an idea of what we do, Eric had an old picture. And in the old picture, well, it's actually right here. In this old picture, there was this rock. So we hiked down along the edge of the river trying to find that rock. Because the rock hasn't really moved that much since it was deposited and the river was there. So by zeroing in and having this picture and looking for that rock, that brought us down to a place where, lo and behold, we found the edges of the dam. And then we crossed the river, and we were able to find some of the remnants and some of the pieces that were left from the dam, because the metal doesn't decay very quickly. And so if you're lucky, and the leaves aren't out too much, and the ferns aren't too high, you're apt to discover some of these pieces that were left behind. This is a boom chain. This I don't think was at Robar. This was at uh, DZ Dam. And out in the middle of the river, there, there are big boom chains. And you can see these boom chains where they are used to haul the logs down the river. And I'm going to go back uh, one more to the one I had up before. So these are some things that we found. There was an old lantern and a dish. And then I'm not sure, Eric, what all these things were. Oh, they're old cans. And we've learned that if, if you find an old can that has a white spot in the bottom of it, that was lead that was used to put in the bottom of the early cans in the 19, early 1900s. So we know if we find that can and it has that white dot in the bottom of it, that it is old. It kind of dates back to when this lumbering camp was being used. Eric, you want to tell them a little bit about the design of the lumbering camps? Lumbering camps were pretty unique. Uh, I got kind of frustrated because I had a bunch of pictures that were labeled differently. 
until I got in the archives of Great Northern and I discovered that they had a plan. And they had a crew that went out and built these logging camps. So every one of the logging camps that I have are almost identical. And they're just different locations. And really, you can't tell until you look at the trees around them. But they were built so that the kitchen in this one is on the left side. If you look at the right side, it was where the men lived. The early logging camps not only did they have a kitchen where the men lived, but the animals also lived in the same building. And if you go back a step further, the animals lived there, the people lived there, they cooked right there, and they didn't even have a chimney. So imagine in the winter, everybody's soaking wet, they come in, dry off, build a fire, have supper, go to sleep in the same clothes, in the same bed, one bed, one blanket for all. That was the life of a logger back then. But it was work and it was money. And it was very important to them. It gave them a job and a, and a reason for existence. I would have liked to do that job. But we as women were home. <laughs> Take care of kids. This area has had a lot of famous people come through. And one of the most famous who came through was Teddy Roosevelt. And Teddy Roosevelt was guided by two main guides. He was a sickly child, and so his parents sent him to Island Falls, the area of Island Falls, to toughen up. And so he had two guides, Wilmot Dow and Bill Sewell, and they took him on three separate trips to this area. On one of the trips, the story goes that Teddy lost his boot. They were going to climb Mount Katahdin, and they had to cross the Wasada Cook in order to do it, and Teddy lost his boot. So he ended up climbing Katahdin with his Indian moccasin on. So it really did toughen him up. This weekend, we actually visited a place, it's not in the monument, but it's outside of Island Falls, called Bible Point. I don't know if you've ever heard of Bible Point before. Bible Point was one of the, where um, Dow and Sewell had made a camp, and Teddy was support, supposed to have taken his Bible and gone off to this point to meditate every morning. So it became called Bible Point, and in 1921 there was a plaque put there in his honor. And then shortly after that, no, I guess it was in the 70s, the land was donated to the state, so it is a state historic site now. It is hard to find. Um, there were no signs except a few ATV signs that pointed us in there. It was a lot of ATV trail. We ended up parking the car at, a gra at the truck at a, va a van at the gravel pit, and then we walked in the rest of the way, which was about a mile. And there were some state placards and signs there that talked about Teddy. And Teddy is believed to have developed his love of nature and conservation at Katahdin Woods and Waters because he was the one that started the first national parks and believed in conservation. So they feel that he got that here in Maine with these gentlemen. As a matter of fact, um, Dow and Sewell followed him to North Dakota when he went to North Dakota and he established his Alcorn Ranch. And they stayed there for three or four years. And there are actually actual clothing of Sue, so, I don't know, was it Teddy Roosevelt or Sue? So, yeah, some of his actual clothing they have at the museum there. There is a park out there that we absolutely love called Theodore Roosevelt National Park. And um, it has bison, it has wild horses, and we just love going there because it's so different than here. So I recommend it. If you go on a road trip, go to North Dakota and go to Theodore Roosevelt National, Monument, uh, National Park. So this is Percival Baxter. You've all heard of Percival Baxter. And he traveled to this area. This was the route that they took to go to climb Katahdin. So they would cross the East Branch and cross through Satakook and they would climb Katahdin. And one of, the fat, one of the famous people that came there that's not as well known is Jake Day. Jake Day created Bambi. So you probably remember as a kid going to see Bambi in the movies and there were two white-tailed deer in Bambi. And so Jake Day was from Wiscataqua, I can't say it, Wiscasset, and he grew up there and he came to the region quite often, to the Baxter-Katahdin region, and drew these creatures. 
And so he said, you ought to have a white-tailed deer in your story about Bambi. So they took two white-tailed deer fawns to Disney Studios, and that's how Bambi was created. So that's kind of an interesting little fact that not a lot of people know. There were other people who visited this area. There was an artist by the name of Church who came here. Um, Henry David Thoreau came through here, and Jane John, Jane, John James Audubon also came to this area. So there were a lot of people that did come through. It's hard when you think about it. There are so few people there now, but in the late 1800s, early 1900s, it was teeming with people. It's just blows my mind to think about that. And one of the most famous people that came through was Don Fendler. How many of you had a chance to hear Don speak? Of course, being a teacher, I had an opportunity to listen to Don speak. But as you know, Don Fendler got lost on the mountain, or lost on the mountain in Maine. And we actually have an original copy of the book. Um, somebody picked it up at a yard sale and gave it to us. Who knew? And then I went to a presentation, and it was a cost a dollar. When I went to a uh, presentation where Don was there, I had him autograph it, so it was pretty special. So it says, to the Hendricksons, this looks like one of the original books. Thanks, sincerely. Don C. Fendler, 91594. So we were lucky enough to have this book autographed. And Don came out, he was discovered by the McMorns at Lunxus Camps. This is Lunxus Camp, but this is like two iterations after the one that the McMorns had. And he, Mr. and Mrs. McMorn heard him calling across the river and uh, for help. And so they paddled the canoe across the river. And all the old camps like that had telephones. And we found telephone wire throughout the woods because they were all connected with telephones. This was before radio came out. And so uh, they called, and his father was able to travel upriver to get Dawn. So the first time we went down here, we were, were actually on our bikes doing a bike, back, bike backpacking trip. I was so excited to go down this road and see the place where Dawn Penler crossed the river because you can look across the river from Lexus Landing and see where Don came. And on some of the trees there, you can find the old insulators that took the telephone wire out to connect Don with his family. So that's really exciting to me. Most of you probably know, because she's native of this area, Lynn Floyd's um, The True Story of Lost Trail. Uh, it is a graphic novel, which is like a comic book. And she tells the story of Dawn, and they tell it in with graphics. And it, it, it is interesting. I like the original better, but for kids that don't really like to read, this is the hook for them to have something that is pictured like this with speech going on. So I just thought I'd share those, those two books with you this evening. The monument has a lot of unique species of flowers and fauna. We like to look for orchids, so there are a couple of places that we go in the monument to look for uh, orchids. This one is a grass pink, and they come out earlier than some of the rest of them. And that one is a fringed purple. My husband actually had took a picture and had it framed. He won the photo contest last year for the fifth anniversary of Catawba Woods and Waters. Who knew? So we have a professionally framed picture of, I don't know if it's that one exactly, but it's similar to that. The east branch of the Penobscot is lined with silver maples, and silver maples are not really common. And so that was one other reason that it became named as a monument. And this is, this is one of my favorite plants. This is a pitcher plant. And I like that because it's an insect-eating plant. It's a carnivorous plant. And so I love to take kids out there and show them this plant. And that's the flower. And then you can look down into the, what they call the pitcher part of it. And it has hairs that direct the insect down in. And the insect can't get out. So that it has chemicals in it that changes it so the plant can use it as well as photosynthesis to survive. And of course, we have 
the animals, why everyone wants to come to the monument is to see a moose. And of course, there's no guarantee that you're going to see a moose or a deer or a lynx or anything like that. So we have black bears. We haven't seen any this year, I don't think, there. We did see one this year. Remember? <laughs> oh, that's right. We were out exploring another swamp and we were headed out on an old logging road and he did. He was looking for food. All of a sudden he kind of looked up and, oh, there are people there. And Eric got a really nice picture of him. And then, of course, he ran away. We have seen moose. This is actually on a trail um, that goes through the monument. It leads to Barnard Mountain. And we have seen moose there. We have seen lynx. We were coming out one day. We had done a program with the, the Katahdin Learning Project. And the bus had just left. And then we were coming out. And there was a lynx that crossed the road. So that lynx had been right around there when we were doing this lesson with the, with the kids. And at Sandbank campsite, the Canada Jays love to come in and steal your food or take your food if you will offer them. Of course, you're not supposed to feed them, but we sometimes do to take pictures. And the last one I think is kind of interesting. We found at one of the huts this caribou antler. And it was actually dated back and found to be one of the antlers that was of the original caribou herd that lived here in Maine. It wasn't the ones that they tried to bring back. And they actually, one of the pens, the pens were in Katahdin Woods, the area of Katahdin Woods and Waters, uh, before it became. And in 1903, a uh, lady by the name of Fly Rod Crosby, she was the first woman Maine guide. She actually shot the last caribou in the state of Maine. And so this was dated back to find it was the original herd. Wow. So it's, it's kind of interesting how everything ties together. I'm going to let Eric talk a little bit about the geology of the area, because he knows a little bit more in depth than I do. There are a couple things about the geology that make it special. Uh, the geomorphology, in other words, the land forms, are where the last remnant of glacier was. And so in the northern part of the monument, where the glacier finally ended, is where what's called the Katahdin Esker starts. And Esker is an upside down river that was formed under the ice. Ends up in Pineal Ridge and Cherryfield. That's where all the blueberry barrens are. And it can be followed from there all the way down. There are a few breaks in it where streams have washed through. But there are kettle holes, and you can see where the glacier itself fell apart, where it stopped, where it grew again, just by walking on a short distance in the northern part of it. The other thing that's important is the uh, there's a series of waterfalls. Maybe there's four of them in name, but there's probably eight in all of them. Each one represents a different, a different time period of geologic time. So they can, uh, scientists can study each and every one of them. And the most important one is the one that's on the right there. On that wall that's on the left side of that, was where they found the first evidence of the continental collisions. In other words, when Africa and the United States went apart, that was where they found the first physical evidence that it really did happen. So that makes it kind of a, geology is kind of important there. The northern half is uh, sedimentary rocks. The southern half is part of granite Lake Baxter. So they're characteristically very, very different. Uh, but the landforms are, are kind of neat. Uh, the, the part that you're missing, is there were two big fires there. 1884, man started a fire, burned down about two thirds of the, of the valley. Uh, windstorm, knocked all the trees down. But in 1904, some men working on Webster Lake emptied a pipe, characteristically of what the workers would do, started a fire. It only burned for three days. But basically what it did is it burned the whole area of the monument in about a third of Baxter. In three days' time, it burns so hot that it mineralizes the soil. So one of the things that's done, there are now little teeny communities of forest, ecology communities that never existed before. So birders love the place because you'll find birds there that don't belong in a certain place because they cross over from the small, maybe one acre that they like to live in, another acre a mile away, and they fly back and forth, so they get to see a lot of a lot of special birds, and a lot of people come there for their life list. I don't know if any of your birders or not, but 
Most birders have a life list where they've got to keep, it, keep track of it. So the geology is special. That's another, another component of it. That's you mentioned the birds, so I'm taking a little sidetrack. I was going to talk about it later, but the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters have put together a list of all the birds that you can find in the monument. And we have met uh, quite a number of groups coming into the monument to get other things checked off on their life list of birds that they want to see. So this is available online through Katahdin Woods and Waters National Monument. I took the time, there are four birds that they come there, and I took the time to learn everything about those birds that was possible to know. So when I talk to these birds that come, they assume that I know everything there is to know about birds. <laughs> In reality, I only know about these four little birds. And the one on the front is one that they love to come to find. Blackback woodpecker, it's kind of a different one. Spruce grouse, which is not so unusual up here, but for people that are from away, it's very, very unusual. Boreal chickadee is another one. Uh, that's chickadee, if you've ever seen, been up north or in the mountains. It's a chickadee that sounds like it's got a sore throat when it <laughs> makes its noise. So those are some of the ones that they like. And the Pelea woodpecker is another, is another one. That's So just the, the top photo is of a float. So during the ice age, the ice picked up, or the glacial, glacial period, the ice picked up these huge stones or rocks. And this one is called the glacial flow because it's the same type of rock that's in the area. Now, other, you may have heard the word erratic. And an erratic is a rock that was trapped in the glacier, and after it melted, it drops. But it's not from the area. It's not the same type of rock that's found in the area. So this is on one of the trails that goes up to Deasy Mountain, where there is a fire cap. And um, these are people from the IAT that are in front of that. And it's called Earl's Erratic because Earl Raymond um, was one of the ones that founded the trail, kind of, and did a lot of work on the fire cap that's at the top of the Deasy Mountain Trail. But the caveat is it's not an erratic, it's a flow, and so they tell everybody, we tell everybody that when we come through. I want to go back here, I think, for just a second. Um, this is my favorite falls on the uh, East Branch of Penobscot. It's called Haskell Rock Pitch. And we've been there all seasons of the year, and it changes character every time you go in there. Uh, we even ski in there in the winter time. And we did, the, did it actually last winter. This is Grand Pitch that he was talking about. This is a little bit further a hike. You can hike here, and you can hike to that one, and then there's another one before that that's called Steer Falls. But this truly is my favorite. And I'm going to call on Eric again to tell you about why it got called Haskell Rock Pitch. And I have another picture later on, too. It was a guy named William Haskell, and he was fairly young, 25. He was a member of a friend's church in southern, southern Maine. And part of it was he went to work there to support his family and to support the church. Um, it was a late log drive. The log drive got hung, which means that it got caught in the rocks because there wasn't enough flow. And so it was in late, late June, and he was the one elected to go out and loosen the one log that Hope would let it go. Unfortunately, as he went out, the log jam let go, took him down the river, killed him. They couldn't find him, so they went on with the log drive because that was what was important. His father, his brother, and the guide came back two weeks later searched the river and found his body in what's called a wing dam, a place that directs the water flow down the river. So what we did is I took the obituary, read it, and it said it was such and such a distance, I think it was 600 rods, measured 600 rods on the map, plotted out very carefully, went there, sure enough we could find the wing dam, we searched around for what would be graves because they didn't take him out, they buried him right there, and lo and behold we found several mounds it could have been. So the archaeologists will come in with ground-penetrating radar, search those spots, because you don't dig them up. We don't take anything. We leave everything. They would search it to see if there's metal in there or if there's a different density in the soil to determine if, if that indeed was his, was his resting spot. So. And to 
to me, when you visit a place like this, when you learn all these little tidbits about history, it really makes a difference. It makes your, your visit a lot richer because it gives you more connection to the land and the people who enjoy, worked here on this land before, the, before our time. In 2020, um, the monument was declared a dark sky sanctuary. So um, we camped last night in Sandbank campsite. And there, there, where we camped with our van and the, the bathroom is the outhouse is right across the way. So I have to get up and go to the bathroom in the middle of the night. So I turn off my flashlight and I'm always going like this to look at the stars because invariably you'll see the Milky Way. Um, and it's just, just gorgeous. And so it's been declared a dark skies. The Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters host a dark sky event every year. And the two years of COVID, it was online. This past year, they brought it back. And they invite astronomers from all over to come in. They do campfire talks and um, go to this, this place. They did it at, at uh, Taylor Camps this year. Was it, which is at the head of the road that you use to drive into Katahdin Woods and Waters at the southern end. And so that's really cool. We were able to go the first year. Usually we're out west visiting our daughter when this happens because it's in September. And we met a lot of interesting people and there are hikes that are going on those days as well and then you get to learn more about things. And the Park Service does have a junior ranger book, which is called The Night Explorer. And we learned from talking to some of the rangers that people like us enjoy doing those junior ranger things as much as the adults do. So they'll have people come in, adults come in, and ask for the junior ranger book so they can go out and do the same activities that the kids are doing. Who knew? <laughs> I mentioned camping several times, so I thought I'd share with you some of the camping places that are there. Um, Eric had mentioned originally that this is still in development. We're only six years in. You're not going to go in and find electricity. You're not going to go in and find uh, nice toilets. They're vault toilets, and that's what we have for right now. We're lucky to have the vault toilets. Those were new. So there were a few outhouses around that were built by some of the camps and some of the places that were there. So there are two official campgrounds right now in the monument where you can camp. One is called Lungsus Campsite, which is near Lungsus Camps where Don Fenler came out. And you can camp, there are what, five or six campsites there and a group campsite and it's near the river. So that's one, that's new, that was built last year. All of them have bear boxes now, so that's progress too. We can protect our food if you're tenting. The, um, there are campsites along the edge of the east branch of the Penobscot where you can camp. This happens to be Big Savoy's campsite that we hiked into last year on the east branch. There are four lean-tos. I'm going to talk a little bit more, but I'll talk about it now. The International Appalachian Trail runs through the National Monument. There are 130 miles of the IAT, we call it International Appalachian Trail, in Maine. They start, it starts at Barnard Mountain in the monument, and there are 30 miles in the monument of some of the remotest places that an IAT through hiker will get on his hike through in Maine. So this was at, no, this was at Lunxus Lean to uh, We backpacked in there a couple of years ago and spent two nights and hiked to Deasy Mountain and Lunxus Mountain. And it, it's very nice. There are, there's one, there are four of them all together. This is Sandbank. This is where we were last night, so that's where we camped last night, and I was telling you about the stars that I saw. And this is our adventure van that we travel in. I call it my step above a tent, because we always tented. And then we decided five or six years ago that we were going to get a van, and we were going to fix it up. So it was a U-Haul van, and Eric 
retrofitted it kind of. We put insulation in it, we put pl uh, paneling on the side of it, we insulated the floor. We don't have a place to cook inside, so we cook outside all the time because I wanted a queen size bed. <laughs> so we sacrificed the cooking space for our queen size bed. So, anyway, so we have. Um, there are drawers in the back and drawers in the front. But you know, we've traveled to Alaska in that and back. And it's really, really been good. It you get to a campsite, you don't have to um, set up a tent in the rain. That's a, that's a good feature. You can turn the, the van on like you did this morning for me and heat it up so it's warmer when I get dressed. It's all good. <coughs> he has rigged up a set of tarps to protect it from the rain. So we can put a picnic table under it and protect it from the rain. We cooked in it once, but unfortunately the smell lingers a long time, so we decided we're not going to cook in that anymore. But it's great. We just came back from Idaho visiting our daughter. This was taken last fall. You can see we amassed a whole lot of wood. And then finally, there are two huts. One is called Haskell Hut, and the other one is called uh, Big Spring Brook. This one happens to be Big Spring Brook. You can only rent them in the wintertime. They're for cross-country skiing or snowshoeing into or backpacking into. So we went into Haskell Hut last winter. We started in, we had our backpacks, we had the sleigh full of, he had one of those orange sleds he hauls behind them. And we, we went in and there was a snowstorm. So we ended up breaking trail most of the way and then the park service came and packed the rest of it the rest of the way. Yay! So we got in there. And then it snowed all night. So guess what we had to do on the way out? We had to pack the trail again. We get almost to the end, about a half a mile from the end, and guess who we see coming in to pack again? The people from the monument. And we know both of the guys, and one of them really apologized to, to us and said, sorry, but it was a hard slog but we had a nice time in, in there. You know, it gives you a story to tell. So, this past year, they have started putting all of these online. So you have to register through, um, through the government. Uh, there is a, what is it, rec.gov. You have to register, and it costs $8 to reserve a campsite. So they are first come, first serve. And, but it doesn't cost any more than that. So it's the $8 to do the registration fee through the government. Any question? Yeah. Is it REC.gov? Yes. Okay. So um, those are some places to camp. If you prefer or you have a big camper, then you need electricity and you need water. There are campgrounds in the area that you can make a reservation and you can camp there and then take day trips into the monument. That is possible as well. And then it brings money to that area as well. A lot of hiking. So I've got a few different trails on here just to mention to you where you can hike and they are on the map. I know you've been looking quite a bit at your map and following along just with some of the places that I've been looking at. I'm going to start down here in the corner. This is Haskell Rock. Remember Eric just talked about Haskell Rock Pitch where William Haskell died? Well, it has this piece of conglomerate rock with a tree growing out of the top of it right in the middle of the river. So this is an interesting feature, I think. And the trail is about, I don't know, it's about five miles round trip to go in. It's over an old logging road. It's fairly gentle. Um, and we have taken a lot of groups in there hiking because it is very beautiful to get down in there and have a picnic. So this one is at the top of Barnard Mountain. I showed you the moose and he was going up to the top of Barnard. It's off the loop road. There's a ledge and then you can look out and you have a beautiful view of Katahdin. And you have a picnic table right on the edge of the cliff, unless they've taken it away because it's a risk. We haven't been up this year. And you have a beautiful view of Katahdin Lake. So this was taken in the fall. So it, this was a, a gorgeous, there's a gorgeous view there. It's real worth it. It's not, there are some steep, steep spots in it. It starts out fairly steep. And the best part of the trail to me is you go right through a rock that's been split. You're shaking your head so you've been there. So 
I really like that trail because of that. Last year, we hosted an IAT hike. We drove into Bolin Camps, which is on the west side of the Penobscot, no, the east side of the Penobscot. And Bolin Camps is a hunting camp. It's very nice. And they have a suspension bridge that goes across the east branch of the Penobscot. And so we took them down on part of the IAT that goes to an old fish hatchery. And this is one of the sites that the archaeologist wants to go see as well, because there is an old well that's there. There are foundations where they ran water down through a sluice to get that. And there was a camp right there, so there are a lot of old cans and artifacts around. And that's, that's a fairly nice hike as well, as long as it's not too wet. If it's wet, it's, it's that day it rained. We had thunderstorms when we were in there. Sun came out. It was incredible. It was a really unique day uh, to be out hiking, but they were all good sports. You can see they kind of look bedraggled, and that's why. <laughs> Up here is another one. Um, this is called Warren Falls, which is a very easy hike to go into. And what I like about Warren Falls is you can see the remnants of where the loggers blasted the rocks. They blasted the rocks in order to run those logs down the river. And you can see that where one piece of the rock is, and then you can, if you look carefully, you can see where another piece of the rock is. Uh, it's nice in low water and in high water. I think we've seen it more in low water than we have in high water. But it is a very nice hike, and it's a pretty hike to do. This is me hiking with a group of kids last year. Um, on the DZ Trail. The DZ Pond Trail is a very easy hike as well. It goes across an esker, which Eric talked about as a, a, a glacial feature that was left. And we talked to the kids about different features that are found in there. This group of students that I was with created a hiking song. They started off kind of making fun of each other, and then the names were coming out of the song. So I said, why don't we make this into a hiking song, and we'll include everybody in the hiking song. So that's what they sang all the way out, repeated, the, and I can't for the life of me remember what the, the words are now, but they included everybody's name in the group. So that was really fun. I had a good time that day. You can see I'm smiling when I came out. So I mentioned the IAT. Uh, the main IAT was uh, founded in 1994 by a man by the name of Dick Anderson, who is still living. As a matter of fact, he was in the hospital last weekend, and everybody was really worried about him. Along with Governor Brennan, decided they wanted to make a trail without borders that followed the Appalachian Mountains. So the original plan was to build the trail in Maine, and it was going to start at the top of Katahdin where the AT, or the Appalachian Trail, left off. There's been some things going on, so we've had to move the trail to the beginning of Barnard Mountain. And it goes from there, uh, the Barnard Trail, and it goes from there, 30 miles in the monument. And uh, we were talking about the top of Deasy Mountain. Deasy Mountain is, um, there is a historic fire cap at the top. One of our members, Earl Raymond, whom I just spoke about a few minutes ago, he put, I'm vice president of the IAT, oh. just to tell you, that's another one of my hats that I wear. Um, created an Alidade, a replica of an Alidade. An Alidade was the a map of the area that was in circular and they used it to triangulate where the fires were when the fire towers were operating in the state of Maine. And so this was the fire warden's cabin. Unfortunately, this is falling apart. I wish that it had been kept because it is historic, but uh, it's fall I don't know if it's retrievable. But it's very interesting to poke around there. There is still an outhouse there, and the outhouse leads like this, so we <laughs> would never go in there. But we did find the dump, and you can learn so much about a place when you look for the dump. <laughs> and there are a lot, it seems to me, Eric, I remember there were a lot of maple syrup jars in that dump. <laughs> best and then, raspberries, too. Pardon? The best raspberries, too. Probably, yeah, on the edge. You never know. That covers up all of it. We found a coal cellar where they, a uh, coal cellar right on a stream that they had. And then um, there's a little 
plat kind of made of birch bark in honor of Mr. Whirler, who with the Whirler Trail that comes up from another angle. He was one of the fire wardens up there, so the trail was named after him. So, and then this was the another group, the sp suspension bridge I was talking about at Bowling Camps. So, we do invite you, we do have online, and I didn't put that in my references that I put at the end, but we do have information online about different pieces in the monument that you're welcome to go online and look up as to what to look for there. The trail goes all the way up to and through the border at Fort Fairfield. So we do have pieces of it here. Last weekend we led a hike up Big Rock from um, the north to the south of a group of people that came up to, there were what, six of us and plus a dog that went, we had a really good time. Uh, it took us about five hours to hike from summit to summit. We had to do some car shuttling things, but we had a really good time. So the IAT does offer sponsored hikes both in the monument and hopefully in other parts of the IAT. Elaine? Yes. Is, is the IAT depicted here on the map? I believe it is. I haven't looked lately, but it was initially. It's because in brown. It's in brown, I said. Oh, this map right Oh, that one. Oh, that one. Okay. okay. That was part of the proclamation, actually, that the IAT went through the monument that helped it become a monument. And as I said, there are four lean-tos that you can stay in along the way, but you have to make reservations. <coughs> are they fairly popular? Or no, if, I don't think so. Not if that somebody much. wants to go make a reservation, is it? Are you pretty much able to get one? Or if you have a range of dates that you might be willing to play with, I think you would. Although we talked to a gen we got a chance to meet one of the through hikers this summer, and he said he came to one of the came to one of the lean tos. You know, the IAT hikers are expecting just to not reserve one. They don't know when they're going to be there, and it had a reserve sign on it. But he said nobody was there by about six o'clock, and I decided, well, if nobody's there by <laughs> then, I can I can certainly camp there. And if I can't, I'll go to a campsite. I'll just pitch my tent some other place. So we haven't had any problems yet with our reservation and reserving. Uh, as a matter of fact, you said where we stayed at Sandbank, there were reservations, but there weren't people there. Or no, or was it East Branch? One of the nice things about Grand yeah. Cove is if you have a campsite you're interested in and you know you just hit availability and it shows you all the dates that there are sites that are open so it's pretty easy if you have some flexibility and then they go around and they put a, the park service comes around and puts a reserve sign on it for you and we've learned a long time ago if the reserve sign in the national park if it's not the date that you're there you can stay in it because it's a first come first serve so just because somebody has a reserve <coughs> sign, always look at the date. And if it's not the day that you're there, you're free to stay in that site. We were on that little trip a long time ago. So there's biking and there's paddling. Eric and I have done, did an overnight bike trip uh, into Big Spring Burke, but I think that was before it became a monument, so we really didn't have to worry about reserving it. It was open in the fall. And then uh, we have paddled a number of times up the river to get to Savoy's campsite and then to hike up to the fire cab. And of course, we love winter. And um, we ski up here once in a while. Yep. So we are able to um, ski in in the winter. A number of years ago, our daughter was home. And so we did a trip into Pasco Hut to spend the night. And this was great because she couldn't take all the heavy stuff. <laughs> and it snowed all the way that time too. All the way in, all the way out. But guess who broke trail for us? <laughs> that was great. We've done quite a bit of snowshoeing down there. So this, had, this is, um, I think that's billfish in the background. One of the mountains that kind of borders Baxter State Park and the monument. And then here's Haskell Pitch in the wintertime. So that's where we skied into in the winter. It's very enjoyable if it's packed. Perpetual. 
Pardon me? Are pets allowed? Yes, on a leash, pets are allowed okay. in the National Monument. So, there is an organization called the Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, and the Friends group, their designation is to help raise money and support the national park itself. So they have been raising money to, right now they're in the process of building a new contact station for people there, and they organize different hiking trips for people to go on. Their website has information about going to the monument and different places that you can do. They are the ones that do the burning. And you can go online and actually print this. I don't think they're printing these anymore. So you can go online and print it. They also have a, if you go to the Loop Road again, they came up with a Loop Road map, interpreted map. And I just happen to have some printed copies. But they've marked out a number of places on the loop road and show you where to visit. So if we're able to put a trip together and some of you come next year, then we'll be visiting a lot of, shameless plug, right? A lot of you might be coming to the, seeing some of the things that are off the loop road, which are short hikes and we'll go visit where Don Fendler came out and we'll do a lot of different things like that. So that's online that you can print. <coughs> and then um, I mentioned Stars Over Katahdin. They have some stargazing tips. So they have another one that they've printed that's, that's online too as well. And then there are lots of other tips and things on there that you can see. So this was last year. We took a group um, into the uh, fit, fish hat. No, this one was just a house to Grand Pitch. We went to Grand Pitch. And um, the group there are actually some, this is at Haskell campsite where we were yesterday. This is some uh, big, huge conglomerate rock that are on the side of the road that have uh, kind of landed together when the glacier melted. And you can go caving in there. So there are places that you can crawl into and through. And that was one of the ladies that came with us last year. This was another, I think this was an IAT hike on the top of DZ Mountain. Through the, or it was through Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters, but that was another hike. And these three are some of my friends that have gone on a number of hikes with us. Katahdin Learning Project is an arm of the Katahdin, um, Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters. And it was begun in 2016, about the the same year that the park was initiated. So the design was to get the kids outdoors. A lot of children today don't like to go outdoors. There's nothing there, there's nothing to do. So they offer hikes, different types of hikes. I think there are six being offered this year, different types of hikes. And children come to the monument and they learn about nature. So this is one of my favorite ones. This is on the DZ Pond Trail. And there are a set of stairs that go down. It's kind of like a <coughs> circular staircase. And I always have them count going down. And it's pretty funny to hear them count if they're kindergarten, first grade children going down these steps and coming back on them. This is a platform at DZ uh, Pond Trail that gets you right out onto the pond. There are blue heron there, we see Canada geese. There are some interesting flowers. There are some pitcher plants that grow right over the edge of the dock and some little green orchids that grow out over the edge of the dock. And it's just fun to get out with kids because they, they're wonder at seeing things and being introduced to different things. And then the stories they tell if their parents have had them out and they have done some things. Friday, uh, I'm going down with a group, going to meet a group from Ashland, and we're actually going to look at, I'm not doing it, but I'm going down with them, learn about glaciers and the glaciology of that particular area. The Time Learning Project also sponsors a teacher camp, <coughs> and it's free to all teachers who wish to come. 
we emphasize place-based learning is where you get out into the area that you want to work with and you get the kids out in that area meeting people and viewing things. This was taken at, well this is one thing I haven't mentioned, on the loop road there's a place called the Lookout and it looks out over Katahdin, it's beautiful. And so this was taken at the Lookout one year when we had nice t-shirts. This one was last, not this past year, but the year before, when we hiked into, we actually hiked to Grand Pitch, but we had a group that came in. This is, the, you can see Haskell Hut in the background here. So I enjoy helping them with that. And this is just another of some of the inside learning that goes on, as well as outside. And this lady up here in the corner, her name is Kayla Rush, and she is the person to get in touch with if you have a teacher in your family or know of a teacher who might be interested in, in cooking up, she is the head of the Katahdin Learning Project. And that's me. That was my, my, my speech for why should we have a monument? Why do we need to get children outdoors? And I never had this before, but now we have a new grandson. So we have the next generation of Hendricksons whom we want to get outdoors. And I will tell you, this little guy, he's now nine months old. This is an old picture from March when we went to visit them. He has been canoeing. He has been cross-country skiing. He has been hunting. What else has he done? He's been, he's been there in their van. They have a van, much nicer van than ours. 39 days this summer or something like that. And he hikes. And it's just incredible, all the things he's been expo Oh, duck hunting. We just came back from duck hunting. <laughs> and he went moose hunting. Our daughter got a moose. A lifetime, once in a lifetime permit in Idaho. And she got a moose this year. So Andrews was on all those trips. So this is the next generation of the Hendricksons who will have to love the outdoors. He has no choice. <laughs> I put together um, just a little reference list and I can send it to Helen and she can send it out to you. But I gave you some links that you might be interested in pursuing if you want to know more information or plan your own trip to go. The uh, National Park Service has a site and they have about Katahdin Woods and Waters. And on it it will tell you if the loop road is open or the loop road is closed. They will close the loop road before it snows. And then they will close the north end to traffic, but let you know when they start packing so you can cross country ski or snowshoe there. Friends of Katahdin Woods and Waters is a place where it has all of those, that information, those brochures and things that I showed you. There are two contact stations at this point in time. One is in the Patton, I put patents, that's not good. Lumberman's Museum, and there is a web link to that. And I think you said you had gone to the Patton Lumberman's Museum. And then uh, there is an office in Millinocket. The Lumberman's Museum is primarily open from Memorial Weekend to Columbus Weekend. This one is open certain hours every, all year round. So, I hope that you will learned a little bit today, this afternoon or this evening about the time we went to Eric, you have something? Yeah, just one last thing um, that I wanted to <laughs> explain to you or let you know. If you open your map like this, the future and what's around it, so you'll understand a little bit better. She mentioned that there's been recent work on a property that could be purchased. In this area over here, this on this side of this map, is Baxter State Park. There's a small pink section here. That's the East Turner lot. That's main public lands. And recently the legislature has okayed the exchange of that to Baxter State Park. So that will, in a short period of time, become part of Baxter State Park to protect it. The, when it was originally proposed, there were 15 parcels of land. Only 13 became the monument, which means there were two that were left. There's money that's been set aside. They're currently negotiating over them, and the League of Eagles in Washington have to resolve all issues of own, past ownership. But this little piece right here, there's a thin sliver here, and then this piece right here, 
uh, will eventually become part of the monument. The other one is, she mentioned the King and uh, Collins have put together a proposal where they've allowed to purchase land. It's all this land down here, down as far as the Millinocket Road. Which leaves basically this one little square here, which um, will never be part of the monument. <laughs> the lady hates the government. It's the main <laughs> Woods Coalition. Uh, but she's very good. She's a good neighbor uh, to the monument. And she doesn't really mind people, people wandering around. Um, the roads are pretty well labeled. Uh, you really have currently only three access to it that are encourage the Swift Brook Road, which is down here, the American Thread Road, which is the extension of the 159 out of Patton, and then just outside the Baxter's north entrance is the north entrance to the, to the monument. Now, I graffitied on somebody's folder here. Anybody have one that I graffitied on because it's got my notes in it? Check at the top. It should be. Graffitied it with my name. You got it? Well, I apologize. I'll trade with you. Here. Questions. Tours, uh, experiences with with membership to the Friends of the Cottonwood Waters group allow us access to travel and tour opportunities. Or is this kind of a hit or miss thing where you, you got to know something? Well, they, the only time that they do uh, trips with folks, the friends, is typically with their, with their uh, celebration. And they're relatively limited. Uh, it's, a, it's a financial thing. They want big donors to have a, have a good experience. Um, but there are a lot of other opportunities that, that people go. Uh, IAT offers sponsored hikes. Those are free, so there's no money involved in there. That um, would be on the IAT website, but if Helen gives me your names and if you're interested yeah. in yeah. email addresses, when they come out for next summer, I can make sure that you yeah. get a copy or a list of them. Knowing that there are organized trips coming. Yeah. It helps. Um, one that piece people have tossed around is maybe a, a three-day uh, hiking weekend where you do three different hikes in camp at Sandbank. Uh, yeah. What that takes is somebody to organize that can have those three sites. And one thing she didn't mention about RETGO, if any of you are over 62, yeah. and I assume some of you are, uh, you can get a card that gets you into everything federal half price. Well, the RETGO is reserves anything that belongs to government anywhere in the country. And you can put your card in there and it automatically charges you less when you, we use it to look for campsites. Coming across country, I just pull up available dates, and I can see when we want to visit places. Because we visited, well, 375 of the federal facilities, so, so quite a few. None of us in this room would qualify. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't imagine how much money we have saved by using that card, number one, to get into national parks and monuments that charge, and number two, to camp, because it's half the price. And tours are the same way, swim tours. Yeah. We've gotten excited because we've got reservations on tours, we've got to use a card. <laughs> <laughs> is that the National Park card? Yes, yes. the National yes. Park card is a... Yes, some of them are pulling yep. them out. Yep. Yep. yep, he's got it right here. It's, the one. Yep. it's got some uh, roses on the front. Uh, it's good for all federal facilities, not just... And Rec Gov is all federal facilities. Um, forestry. Yep. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Fish and wildlife, it does not matter. Any other questions? When you said the senators are not not always in for it, right? Is that our current? Are you talking main senators or the senators? No. Uh, the the rest it, there's a difference between a monument and a national park. Is that a monument is designated by the president through an antiquities act? In order for it to become a national park, it has to go through Congress. Yes. Right. And so. Without the support of Congress, not our congressmen, but without the support of all of Congress, it will never become a park. If you look at Acadia, it started out as Sierdemont Springs National Monument, then it became Lafayette National Park, and then eventually as it grew and gained in size, it changed to Acadia. So many, many, many 
of the national parks in the system started as national monuments. But it helps if your own senators are in favor. Without your own senators, it's not going to happen. But it has to go through Congress. Congress declares, and there are nine of them right now that they're considering for the next national park. And Katahdin Woods and Waters is one of the nine. Okay, but the problem uh, is that with the, just Biden just reimbursed Trump's decision about the Western Monument, wasn't it? it one in Utah. Well, didn't, didn't, didn't he reverse that? Yeah, they they played that's Bears Ears, and that a lot of people don't understand. National monuments can be one of five facilities. That one happens to be Bureau Bureau of uh, Public Lands, and you can have them in forestry. You can have them in national monuments. Uh, national Park Service can have monuments. Uh, Fish and Wildlife can have monuments, and the Department of War, Department of Defense can have monuments. And so that one happens to be Bureau of Public Lands. Um, it's a little bit different. What they do with that one is it's been established, uh, but they keep changing the size on it. What many people don't realize is uh, President Trump was not a great fan of national parks, but he did make five of them uh, national monuments. So, you know, and Biden's been a little busy with some other things, but I think by the time he gets close to the end, you'll see that he will do the same thing. Trump did it in his last few, last few months. Biden will do it in time. Most presidents do it within the last three or four months of their, when they get done. They create. They create, yeah, yeah. And some of them, some of the national monuments are, are really tiny, and some of them are huge. Uh, we visited a number of places that became national monuments after we visited them, uh, which is kind of strange. And, and there's an app on the phone that has all the monuments and the facilities in the country. And we, when we travel, we just say, oh, here's one we haven't been to. We'll go to that. And some of them are really awful. Uh, I've driven on the worst roads ever that I've driven on in one in uh, northern Wyoming. And some of them just surprise you because uh, we've driven by one probably 10 times and never stopped there. And the superintendent at the monument, Tim Hudson, said, you've got to stop there. And we finally stopped there, and we've been there three times since. <laughs> so, you know, you never know. Um, and Maine has several listed facilities. Uh, one that I haven't been to is uh, the Acadian um, Village, Village is, is a national park facility now. Um, Maine has another one that's uh, St. Croix, if you're not familiar with that. It's an island. Between, it's a park which is shared between Canada and the United States. They have one on Campobello. FDR is, is a shared park between Canada and the United States. Acadia, which we know, and the Appalachian Trail. And what a lot of people do, and this one right here does it religiously, has a little book, and every one you go to, you can stamp it, and it puts a date on it. I ran the visitor center for the National Monument. The day it opened, and people flew in specifically to get their book stamped, and that was it. Uh, <laughs> didn't even make it in the monument. And you know, to one of the funny, just to give you a little vignette, all the big news outlets were there because the Department of Interior was there, the Secret Service was there, and those guys were a little weird. They were really worried about their guns in the woods. I don't know why, but they were. <laughs> but they all went in in the same car, and we warned them. And when they came out, they'd gone in, and there was some past a beaver flowage. The beaver dropped a tree across the ground, across the road in front of them, coming out. So the four of them got out of their car, pushed the tree out of the way. Three of them on one side, one of them on the other side. The three on this side let go, and the guy on the other side went wingo. <laughs> so when they came in to write their stories, they didn't talk about the monument. They just had this story that was, you know, way over the edge, and they were so excited about it because they'd never seen beavers. These guys are all from the big city, you know, and it's just it was pretty amazing to listen to them operate and work. But a lot of people worry about the monument, and there are a lot of things that you hear out there. Um, some of them surprised me that people asked, and you know, working in the visitor center, I've been blasted by a number of people who want to know why they're going to put an airport in. Um, this one is designated to be a rural dirt roads. The dirt roads will never change. Uh, they'll get better, just as Baxter will never be paved. And part of the edict of Baxter is to remain wilderness, which is back country. Part of the edict of the monument is to be front country, which means that you could drive around, in your car and be a windshield tourist and enjoy yourself. Baxter, if you're going to Baxter, you can't really see the mountain, you know, because everything you have to have to walk to. So that's basically the difference. 
Within five years of the opening of it, it has 60% of the number of people that visit Baxter, which is pretty good. Uh, and the original hope was that if somebody came to Acadia to visit for five days, that one day they might come up and visit. And that's pretty much what it's been. We've been there in days, and you might see 30 cars, and one of them from Maine. I mean, and people come from all over. Uh, they drive too fast on the dirt roads. Most of you folks have been on dirt roads. <laughs> I drive a pickup on a dirt road, and I drive just as fast as anybody else. But I got passed by a Prius in there one day <laughs> on a dirt road. And then when we got to the lookout, the people complained about the shape of the roads. You know? <laughs> Another one warned the, wrote a letter to the superintendent, said that the roads need to be worked on because he got airborne going over a knoll. <laughs> going too fast so you never know what you'll what you'll find but you do see pets in there you were the one asking about somebody was asking about pets you do see pets um, most people are pretty good about it um, it's the point where um, the wild animals there aren't that many interactions there are a tremendous number of bear uh, a lot of moose not very many deer it's pretty rare to see a deer uh, but lynx are very common uh, had a lady one day that was complaining she wanted to see a moose, but the only thing she'd seen it three links. And I said, "Hey, you don't realize how lucky you are, you know." But uh, so you know, it's people. It's a, it's an interesting. A lot of people from the city, and I have to keep reminding myself that most people that visit are from the city, have never seen the forest. Uh, you guys have driven in the forest and seen trees. If you've driven down Route 11, you know, most people never get a chance to see forest. You know, it's in its natural state, so. Are there any more questions? How handicap accessible is it? They're working on it. They have, have one trail that's ADA approved. Yeah. Uh, their new contact station is supposed to have four miles of uh, wheelchair accessible trails. Wheelchair. Um, we walked on some this morning before we got yeah, thrown out. Nice. Um, it's an active construction site, but we wanted to see it, yeah, so we went yeah, in and told us to, you know, you know the deal. But those trails were very nice. And what they are, are, are uh, they're typically uh, six feet wide. The bridges are all edged, and it's... <laughs> yeah, I can't push them in. <laughs> no, you can't push them in. It's uh, rolled uh, limestone, crushed limestone, rolled crushed limestone. So it probably be a little smoother than... Uh, the Heritage Trail, yeah. but very similar to that. I don't think that's slated to open until 2023. So that's slated for next year, but the the uh, one that's approved now, the they have uh, two campsites that are specifically approved for that. Sandbank are all all accessible, but the two that are are uh, that were built that were supposed to be ADA really don't quite fit it because the campsite, the trail to it is, but the parking is not. So their their game plan is to change that so that to, to make it approved. Thank you. I'd like to I'd like to thank Elaine again for all of the efforts that you put into I'd also like to to mention her sidekick over here <laughs> who, who had substantial contributions tonight as well did a great job <laughs>